what's going on guys it is thursday night so we of course have another fantastic episode of the cbsi bolo show planned just for you guys as always this is pre-recorded we're actually recording it wednesday night and for those that paid attention we apologize for not having a hot and cold episode this week but it's because we're planning and packing and getting ready to go to a baltimore comic-con but before i get any further into any of this I want to introduce my co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? I tell you what, Brian, it feels weird starting off the week with the Bolo show. Kind of old school how we used to do it. But we're here. It's it's new comic book day. A um, bunch of new releases. A lot going on this week. So it's a good one, and I'm happy to talk new comic book day. And all the ups and downs of this week's releases. Yes. Before we get into the releases, as I kind of mentioned before, we are getting ready for Baltimore Comic Con. Jack and I, bunch of also Simple Man's Comics Patreon members, we're all going to be at Baltimore Comic Con hunting for books. Not only hunting for books, but Jack and I will be creating content for the channel at Baltimore Comic Con as well. So if you're there, make sure, say hello, say what's up. We'd love meeting everyone. Always lo enjoy talking comic books. You see us, say hello. Well, also let us know um, in in the comment section uh, what 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 Baltimore Comic Con coverage would you like to see? What what if you can't make it to the con? What would you like us to show you from the con? Um, we're gonna try to give you that con experience as best we can while still making sure that we interact and have fun. But we would love to know from you guys, the Simple Wins Comics family, what it is that you would like to see. Right, and without. Holding it up any longer, we're going to bring up this week's Bolo List. As always, as if this is your first time watching this show or wondering what the Bolo List is, it is the Be On The Lookout list that gets created every week where we cover first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and then Jack has one long-term play title that we think isn't really worth the quick flip, but is worth buying and stashing in that short box, long box further on down the road. That being said, we're just going to jump right into first appearances for this week, which is a short list, and we got, this was Dark Multiverse Batman Nightfall number one. Right, and now this one easily, easily, probably could have been argued for long-term play of the week. Um, it's one of the only books I actually read in full so far this week uh, is uh, like brian mentioned in the intro crazy week getting ready for baltimore comic-con but this book was fabulous i mean just i i don't know how you guys feel out there um simple ones comics family but i thought this book was amazing and this book gives us two first appearances we have saint batman um kind of a futuristic batman and we also get uh the son of bane in this book which was kind of like a well-advertised you know, talked about character leading into this book. Great issue. Uh, awesome back and forth. I think the art is very well done on this book. And, you know, it's hard to, to normally I would look at these, uh, these dark universe type books and say, you know, it's kind of Elseworld. I wouldn't take much stock in a first appearance as a speculation play, but after Batman who laughs and everything that's happened with the DC metal dark stuff, um, I think, it's all in play at this point, Brian. I think uh, I think it's very hard to discount these books. And I kind of like that there's only a cover A. I know that there's some store variants for this, but, you know, really you're just looking at cover A as far as, you know, on the shelf at your LCS. And I think that that bodes well for this book. Five ninety nine cover price. You're getting two first appearances. That Who knows where they could lead in the future? And we've seen it with writers like Donny Cates with Marvel. Like you just, you never know when a writer is going to reach back into other releases and, and use a character that they really resonated or connected with. And I think that these two characters um, from this issue kind of get have an opportunity maybe to be something at some point um, with this being kind of like a futuristic dark universe story. Right. And, that kind of wraps up the first appearances for this week. But real quick, before we get further into the Bolo list, let us know in the comments what books you guys picked up this week. Let us know what books you guys enjoyed. Also, if you're talking about speculation or flipping, which book do you think 
would probably be the hottest book this week from a speculation flipping standpoint. We like to cover all angles here, whether it's reader, speculation, flipper, comic community as a whole, what releases came out this week that you were most excited for or enjoyed reading the most. Also, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button, and if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. And there's de and there's definitely um, probably a couple other first appearances out there um, from books releasing this week. Again, if you notice that the title heading, um, this is for uh, confirmed first appearances. So we know that those two first appearances exist in that Batman book. There was a looks like a new character reveal at the end of Captain America 15. We don't really know yet. Um, and also there's going to be some debate about Captain Marvel. But we're going to get into that later on. We're going to move right on now into the Reader Buzz section. And the first book on the Reader Buzz this week is The Mask. I pledge allegiance to The Mask, number one. We're starting in, into those books that we covered on the last call show, which if you're unaware of that show, that's a show we have on Friday nights covering pre-final order cutoff, the last chance to get those books in before Diamond cuts the orders off on that Monday night. But... The mask number one, Jack. Yeah, um, you know I've I've openly talked about on the show that I'm not the biggest dark horse fan. Um, it's not naturally properties that I look at, but this this week this is kind of like the book. Maybe I was most intrigued to read. Um, you know, I grew up born in the '80s, grew up in the '90s. The mask movie was a you know big deal when I was a kid. Jim Carrey was you know everything. He was our um, you know, Seth Rogen, I guess you could say, uh, for our generation. Um, but this has a very different feel. This is very, uh, this seems like the mask has kind of aged with us. Um, and I kind of like that. So there's more dark, um, sinister feel to this. Really plays on the mask's um, traditional roots of being like a serial killer. Um, and there's definitely still that comedy element you can see with, it, with those two covers. Um, and I like both covers. I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, Andy Tomlin on the Andy Spotlight series. This was his pick of the week. And he was talking about the Albuquerque variant, which is the one on the right with the, you get kind of like the flag look, which is amazing. But I think even that the realistic kind of mask face and cover A is outstanding as well. Um, and it, this is just cool. It's cool to see a property like the mask, which is something that maybe would be laughed at. Just the concept of the bass returning, especially if you grew up in the era when, you know, familiar with that movie. But I think that Dark Horse may have pulled this one off um, because of the amount of buzz that was leading into this release. I think most collectors who, you know, buy a lot of comics were picking this one up to read today. Um, whether it becomes something down the road, I don't know. Could I see another movie maybe based on this type of series? Sure. Um, but I don't know that this is a true speculation play as much as it is just an intriguing read that I think a lot of collectors and, and at comic book advocates want to check out. But let again, let us know in the comment section, did you pick this book up? If you did, what did you think of it? Um, and do you think that there's any speculation with this book? No, but I don't think there's much speculation. But one thing we got news about today, which I think has caused a lot of fires and a lot of books are going off eBay right now is Netflix picked up an animated series for Bone. Right. Right. And again, that's where that, you know, that first look Dark Horse deal. Um, and I think the fact that they picked up that the deal the thing with Bone, um, it bodes well for properties like this um, that are maybe a little bit more out there. Now, Bone has been, is an absolute comic book classic. Yeah. But it's it, that's a tougher um, adaptation than others. And, it, you know, that, that animated... The animated realm is just constantly expanding. It, you know, a year ago I would have laughed at those type of things, and now it's it drives speculation without doubt yeah. into the Spider Verse. I think it's really made a huge difference. Yeah, and it's important to know that Bone. There were some Bone books that were already up there in price, so it's not just oh, yeah. that news that that drove it. But um, so there's the difference there between this book and and Bone, but. It, I saw the correlation there and thought, you know what? Who knows? Maybe. Who knows? I have doubts that Mask will ever be to that popularity, but that's why it's in the Reader Buzz section. And then the next book that's in the Reader Buzz section was March number one. This actually had, there was a 
third cover for this, I believe, right? There was like a giveaway variant from what I was reading. They had um, cover A, cover B, and then I see there's a cover C floating around there for a giveaway variant. But I couldn't find the art for it. Yeah, this this is one, obviously, we talked about this one with um, the uh, pre-FOC show. This is kind of a, lo- a nice long-term image play. A lot of retailers are very, very, very high on this book. Um, a lot of people are going very long on cover A, I've actually heard. And I think that's, to me, you know what that indicates to me, Brian? The fact that we heard from some of our retailers that they were going cover A means there's people that think that this is a option possibility because we've talked about when books get option that cover a popping off because that's what kind of like the media picks up on and we also always so, say with independent books you're you're better off with cover a than the other books sure but just at first glance that wraparound cover b tends to i mean i would think that that'd be better cover but you um, don't see it's a wraparound if it's in a bag and forth yeah, there's no we doubt made, we've, talked, we've, about we've that. talked about that before too with some beautiful wraparound covers right um but it just yeah if you look at those two covers, I guess maybe it, maybe it could just be personally me. Again, let us know, Sipple and Comics family, what you think. If I'm just looking art alone, I'm looking cover B. Having said that, if I'm looking investment, I'm absolutely thinking cover A because of what we talked about. But it, it seems like that's the way retailers are leaning, which makes me think that there's a lot of people that believe in the option for this one. Um, so it'll, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I, I think that this is a, another book that could easily have been picked for the long-term play of the week. Picking indie books like that is difficult, but that's why it's truly long-term plays because, you know, it's very – yes, there's the occasional image book that pops week one. We've seen that, right? And it was very prevalent when you and I first got into this. There was a time when, you know, image books were constantly 8 to $10 on release, $20 at times. But now that's not really the game. It's a buy-and-hold game. And you kind of got to pick which books you're kind of in the corner of. But I like this one. I think this is one that could – it's got that dark horror, occult type you know, theme that is doing extremely well right now. And another thing I'll bring up is tattoo culture is huge. It's really big at this point. Um, tattoo TV shows do extremely well. Um, we're seeing – we're coming through a generation that's more and more tattooed um, – you know, and Brian and I are two guys who each each have tattoos, but aren't tattoo guys. But there's a lot of people who just live that culture, you know. Um, so there's, yeah, I think that that kind of plays into the, the possibility and success of this. Definitely. The next one comes from Marvel, which I'm pretty sure Marvel is Latin for thousands of covers. <laughs> but we're talking about Absolute Carnage number four yeah absolute carnage number four was a highly 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 anticipated um issue right yeah, and i don't want that what multiple one in 25s that we talk about yes and i don't want to downplay the events of this book right because the events were very important to the story but maybe not what speculators were anticipating would you agree with that brian correct so you know i think we were all expecting maybe a death maybe um a new character Maybe this is where Dylan gets whatever he's going to get. Antici- everyone's anticipating that like everyone was anticipating Naomi books at the time. Yeah, you know, that's actually a very good correlation. It is a lot like that where you just – every issue you're expecting it to be the issue. So in this issue, you know, we see um, we see Carnage kind of take care of, uh, of um, the Hulk-Venom hybrid um, – Drinks the Codex, which is kind of a gangster move, I would say. Um, the Maker's big evil plan is revealed. So we know now that, you know, the Maker is collecting Codexes himself. And uh, he's not destroying them. He's collecting them. And uh, I think that was kind of one of those reveals that was like, you kind of saw that coming. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> yeah. Um, still a great story. I like how. We get spoiled, I think, at times where we expect every issue in the story to be like the blockbuster grandiose. And then, I mean, shame on Marvel. I won't say shame on Marvel, but kind of solicited as we were expecting more as well. But it's still a great story. I mean, Donny Cates, Carnage. I mean, can't find any hotter titles right now with the whole absolute Carnage and and the whole Venom and soon to be Thor. 
wrapping up Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, Donny Cates has definitely made his mark. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to continue reading it, though. That's for sure. Yeah, this one, though, like, I agree with you on, like, the way kind of comic book speculation culture has become. It's kind of like a every issue anticipation. This one, though, I, I blame on Marvel. This is the <laughs> solicit. The solicit. Um, but, again, this is what this is a great educational kind Or you could say of, kudos to Marvel because they obviously true. did their job. Because <laughs> it is their job. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. This is a great kind of lesson. This is why we did the last call show, right? Yeah. Is we wanted to – not only do we have the ability of talking about what we see when we look at solicits, right, and what you and I are thinking when we're putting in our comic book previews orders – the great thing about this that I don't think either you or I anticipated when we started that show is now we get to see these books to fruition. Yep. And we we get to see how they come out. So all the people who think that like we're like kind of tank the comic book market because we're going to cause all these issues to go up. We've actually had several issues that we felt good about that haven't done that well. That the, They didn't really reveal the way we would think, thinking about like ASM 3, um, this book. And I think it's largely be- this – absolute carnage story and it chasing that elusive moment that we all kind of anticipate um but the solicits are going hard with these all right now taking all that out of it to be positive about this book some incredible variant cover art on, on this issue um the added incentives that you talk about kind of is another thing that led to believe that this was going to be a major major issue that maybe it wasn't um the return of like the venom with wings is cool but it's not a first appearance, right? So it's not like going to pop off anything. Um, and the last thing I'm going to mention about this is you mentioned this a couple weeks ago. And I think it's gone under the radar, Brian. Um, those connecting covers with like that almost classic movie trade dress, right. um, I think those are amazing long-term plays. They are starting to do very, very well on the secondary market. They're still flying kind of under the radar in comparison to some other things going on in the hobby. Um, and we now no longer have House of X and Powers of X to chase. Um, but I think that those are ones to keep an eye out. And if you're at your LCS and you see any of like the back issues of issues one through three, um, it may be something to take a look at. I, I really think that they're going to continue to grow. I doubt you'll be able to find them let, sitting on your LCS. But again, I say that from Rock Hill, South Carolina. I don't know where you big city guys, uh, you know, what you guys have sitting on your shelf. So, um, but that's something to keep an eye out for. Definitely. We're going to move right along now in the next one. Sticking with the Spider-Man family, we're going with Spider-Man number two. Right. So now this is another one where, ah, you know, this the, the way they did this book is tricky, right? Is this the first Benji Spider-Man? Um, okay, he wears the suit, but he's not really being Spider-Man in this issue. Yeah. Um, very hard to call the way they did this um we did have our one of our inside retailer sources tell us that they were going to kind of play this game that they were going to drag out what issues were important um which is smart yeah and up sales figures yeah we did hear like there would be an issue that looks like he's gonna be spider-man and then he is spider-man and then he gets his own suit um so we were warned that like two through four was going to kind of like slight progression each issue, making almost each issue important, right? So I do think that this issue is important. Um, I do think that this issue um, is going to lead us somewhere. Um, we get cadaverous kind of coming back full force. Uh, some hints that possibly there could be some dissension and, and tension between Peter Parker and Benji Parker. Um that that's the part of, of the story that maybe intrigues me the most. You know, either way, just another great book. Um, I really enjoy. I'm really enjoying this series. I I don't want to rehash my feelings on this book, but if you are not checking out this book and your LCS still has copies of issues one and two, grab them. And if you're a Spider fan, I think if you're a Spider fan, you're gonna love these books. Yes, and speaking of issue number one, our channel sponsor Frankie's Comics has a fantastic. Store exclusive for issue number one still available. So if you're interested in that, make sure you guys check that out. But we're the gonna move. only cover with cadaverous on it. Yep. And I guess we're gonna move right on into the list with Guardians of the Galaxy number ten. All right, you talked about Donny Cates, the work of Donny Cates, and uh, you know he has really um, developed two things with this series, right? The Universal Church of Truth 
which I think has been a cool entity, right, that he created um, that I think if you want to talk about first appearances and something that later on could be something, keep an eye out on that, okay? I think that that's something that down the road could be something. I also think something to know is who's taking over on the series is Al Ewing. And Al Ewing, if you're not really familiar, that's a Mortal Hulk. Um, Al Ewing's hot right now. I kind of have faith in where he'll like pick this ball up and go with it. And I don't think he's just going to take over and reboot the series. I, I think it's going to build on what Donnie's been doing, right? And then the other story has been the death of Rocket Raccoon and the consistent tease of that and march towards that um, from, say, I think 7 to 10. So, um, you know, you get the cover of this one kind of like telling you what it is. Uh, issue 7 kind of started the process. Um, and this is another one where Marvel solicitations – I've kind of roped you in seven, eight, and nine, and uh, ten is definitely no different. So you know, Marvel's doing their thing from a sales perspective. You can't get mad at them, like Brian mentioned. You know, it's what it's what they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed to sell comic books. Um, but I think if you want to take a step back, rather than getting mad at them, like tricking you, um, it's also led for enjoyable reads because you've been kind of strung along the entire time. And if you really, you may feel some sort of way about that, but if you think about it, that's what you want from your comic books. You want that cliffhanger. If, if not this month, next month, that's what keeps you coming back from month to month, grabbing books. And the last thing I'll say about this book, we've talked about this, this run that Donnie did on guardians absolutely slept on in comparison to his other stuff that he did. um, It really has not been paid attention to. I think a lot of LCSs I go to still have back issues dating back to issue number one on the shelf in a lot of places. Um, I think it is worth picking up. I think that there is probably some gold to be mined from these issues going down the road, specifically that universal church truth. I think it says something about this title as well, where I've never seen the comic live up to the hype of how good the movie was. I'm not yeah. saying the stories aren't good. It's just the popularity of the actual title. If Donnie can't, if Donnie Cates, you know, he done his, I love the story. He did an excellent job with the Guardians of the Galaxy. But you're not seeing that level of attention that you do on his other titles or even what the Guardians of the Galaxy movie does. Now, I'm wondering, we just also got news that Kevin Feige is now the chief creative officer of Marvel Comics. Is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing with comics because i don't exactly want my comic books to really be i don't want it to be part of the mcu (laughs) right i i'm gonna on the fence on that i I was gonna bring that up i was gonna bring that up right when you started down this um this road because i think possibly for guardians it could be a good thing if we get more of like the movie feel that we all love um i could see where you're coming from that if the comics are strictly like the MCU, it's certainly a um, – it's limiting, right? right. But at the, at the same point, for speculators, I think it should be a good thing because, number one, who says he's going to make every comic like the MCU? But if there is a further MCU tie-in, that's going to – again, that makes it easier for speculation. Um, the lot that goes on in the MCU that doesn't ever happen on the publishing side – and even key moments um, like, you know, um, Captain America picking up Thor's hammer has spiked back issues. So if we have more moments like that show up in the comics that we've seen on the big screen, there could be future speculation plays kind of all over the place. But we'll have to see. It's going to be one of the most intriguing things to follow in the comic book industry for sure is Feige's um, new role as chief creative officer of Marvel. And the whole company where I'm actually hopeful and where it's kind of being overlooked is him taking over the TV program. I think that part of it's being overlooked. I think um, no disrespect to Jeff Loeb, but that's been the kind of the weak link in Marvel. And now the hope is that Feige will have have that further integration and up the quality. So uh, that that part of it, I'm hopeful for. And maybe TV spec will become a thing again. Well, up the quality, you're also going to have to up the budget true true or just use the budget a bit better because some of those shows have huge 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 budgets like shield and you sit there and go in my opinion i just had this conversation with my brother shout out to mark defiant who's probably in the chat 
Um, they spent a fortune on S.H.I.E.L.D. every episode. But I don't want to see S.H.I.E.L.D. in space. That's not what S.H.I.E.L.D. is to me. I think they could have had an amazing, say, cop drama with S.H.I.E.L.D. rooted in the real world dealing with the fallout of what our superheroes do, which is what S.H.I.E.L.D. is supposed to be. They're, they're kind of like that first line of defense um, for the people. Um, and I, I think they got away from that. And I got to believe all that money they spent on going into space and that kind of look could have been appropriated better and stay more in line with what the shield kind of we all grew up with with the comics but so my hope is feige gets those kinds of things right um but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see and then hopefully we wouldn't have a debacle like the inhumans was which was expensive but looked like it was cheap right and if you're watching, let us know in the comments, what do you think about Kevin Feige being the chief creative officer of Marvel? Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing for comics or just undecided or just don't care? But um, we're going to keep moving on into the reader buzz. And the next one is Teen Titans number 35. Right. So there's been a big tease going on um, throughout this last arc about who is going to be the Titan who... Um, is kind of the Judas of the group, right? Who is that kind of betrayer? Um, and full disclosure, I have not gotten a chance to read this book yet. But that's where I'm going to say, Simpleman's Comics family, boil it in the chat. Let everybody know. Let every, Everybody wants to know. Um, everybody wants to know who this is. But this is a book I'm excited to read that I have not gotten a chance to read. Um, there is supposed to be a, a kind of, um, like I said, a Judas in the group. Um, there's supposed to be a couple major reveals in this book. Uh, my kind of gut was maybe it was going to be Crush. And she was going to kind of take on that, like, bad guy root of, um, you she know, Father Lobo. Bailey, turn heel. Yeah, that's a good reference. That, that definitely was my thought. Um, but I could be just, I could be grabbing low-hanging fruit and being a little obvious. So um, I'm interested to read this book. I have to say cover A is phenomenal. I think cover A is excellent. Yeah, I was going to say that too, uh, especially now that Alex Garner's not on the, what is it, um, is it Lee Garbett, I think, that did cover B for this one? I'm not sure. Yes, I think but, so. Um, yeah, me, cover A is definitely the one I, I picked up on this. I, like you, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but um, have been digging this series. But like he said, go ahead and spoil it in the com spoil it in the chat, spoil it in the comments. Um, let us know. And uh, next book, Into the Reader Buzz is once in future number three i can't believe we're on issue number three i figured you know we were gonna get some more printings of <laughs> number two or something but we we did actually yeah. there is another printing for number two out this week um i think the third printing yeah. but yes there's also number three released this week um the story continues uh again this is amazing that this is now an ongoing um so we are gonna kind of get to take this ride long term um if you're not reading this book, this is uh, this is one of my favorite books at this point on the market. It's it's got a good mix of like fantasy and funny, so it's kind of plays in multiple worlds. Uh, I'm not the biggest fantasy reader, or at least I thought I wasn't, but it seems like more and more fantasy books are coming out that I really really dig. Um, Brian and I checked out Folklords recently, and uh, definitely a book that I would not wouldn't be on my radar. Excellent read. Excellent read. And it's one of those comics that gives you just enough that you're really interested, but doesn't give you enough that you feel like you're there yet. So you got to go into issue two. You're just going to have to. Um, so Boom knows what they're doing right now. Like I, People think that we are, you know, homers for Boom, and maybe we are. But I don't know any other company that is humming the way that they are. Um, yeah. And I think the popularity of Once in Future and Something is Killing the Children is going to continue. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. We've, we've said it before. I'll come out and just straight out say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a homer for Boom, but for a good reason. The one thing, you're talking about fantasy, right? And mm -hmm. I like fantasy, but I'm lazy, so I tend to like to watch fantasy. That's what I like about these books. It's like dumbed down enough for me to where I can enjoy it. Like if I tried to, I enjoy lord of the rings but holy crap reading token books is just too much work for me 
That's why I like books like this because it's that level of fantasy, but it's not so cerebral that I can actually enjoy the story and enjoy what's going on in it. And it just takes me back to, like I always say, I'm mostly nostalgia driven, especially when it comes to comic books. And it takes me back to that time as first time I saw Indiana Jones or mixed with that level of fantasy. Uh, so it's kind of like Lord of the Rings meets Indiana Jones meets Game of Thrones meets, like I said before, stop my grandma's shoot, but and still enjoying this, still enjoying something that's killing the children, which we're going to get to in a little bit. In fact, we're going to get to it right now. And something is killing the children. Number two was on the reader buzz, which came out this week as well. Right. And, and again, you can almost say the same thing. It's not a fantasy book, right? It's very much kind of like murder mystery kind of mayhem type book. Um, the same, it's amazing that these books are running kind of simultaneous, you know, just an issue off of each other because they really both are kind of you know, like dominating reader buzz, dominating secondary market um, as far as independent comics, kind of like setting the marker for the entire independent comics market. Um, and then the way those late printings are being kind of uh, short printed and in demand is is really driving a lot of speculation and it's cool to see speculation beyond issue one so we're seeing some of that with some of those like low print late printings and you're already seeing tons of cosplay for this book yeah so that you, character erica slaughter yep. is being cosplayed like crazy and then also you had at new york comic-con um you saw Boom at their panel, give away the, the, the kind of bandana that she rocks. Yeah. And I think that was smart because yeah. that's only going to further that kind of cosplay effort. And that cover on the right, the green cover, that was their FOC variant that they released right before FOC. Right. So. Then moving on along, set foot and fancy free. The land of many covers again. We're talking X-Men number one. This had a lot of, lot of reader buzz, especially coming out of House of X, Powers of X. But I haven't read it yet. <laughs> yeah, I haven't read it yet either. Um, obviously, this is one that I'm one of the ones I'm more excited about. But it's also one of the ones where it was like, I don't think there was a. It wasn't like the first book I went to because I think that there's, there's time with it. Um, and I, so that's where I'm getting with this one. Um, there was some question about, like, well, why isn't this book, like, your long-term play of the week? You know, can you, and if you were asking me what's the biggest book of the week, certainly X-Men 1 is the biggest book of the week, right? There's just zero doubt about that. Um, I mean, they had a midnight release party for it. Right. Midnight launch party. Um, a lot of store exclusives. Shout out to Frankie's Comics, who had the... Um, who had the... Uh, the Lee uh, X-23 variant. Uh, you know, there was a lot of that, but at the same point, here's the thing. And I'm not downplaying this book. There's been a lot of X-Men number ones, right? A lot of them. Um, now, that does not mean that a book isn't going to do well. Um, when we talked about, you know, the J.J. Abrams Spider-Man, I said that one of, like, the negatives that a commenter had brought up was that there was a lot of, say, Spider-Man number ones. Um and I say that that doesn't have any bearing on this one. Um, so for the most part, I say it doesn't with X-Men either. Um, but it does affect the perception when you start looking at, like you said, a book with a high print run, tons of covers. Um, it's really all about what happens in the guts of the book. Now, full disclosure, I haven't read the book yet. But there hasn't been that buzz going around t today saying like, did you read this book? Look what happened. Um, so, again, let us know in the comments section if something happened in the book that you feel like is speculation worthy. But either way, I think that this is going to be a variant cover play where a lot of people are going to kind of pick their favorite variant cover art. There's some real great ones out there. Um, I kind of like the Mark Brooks Every Mutant Ever kind of cover. Um, a lot of people are obviously drawn to the high ratio uh art germ variant but uh i even think the one in 100 is very nice as well but you know i think you kind of can't go wrong there's a lot of great ones with this book yeah i'm a big marco Cicchetto fan but i wasn't sold on that cover i kind of yeah. like the 
Um, and then out of all the great covers, I've heard a lot of people mention, like, especially with a book like this, with this launch, Lionel Francis Yu, fantastic artist, but a lot of people didn't like that cover A art yeah. for such a big book. And I heard the same thing. You, um, you mentioned about how many copies there are probably of this. The print run, you mentioned that's a number one. Kind of reminds me of what's your favorite X-Men series, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. That Jim Lee X-Men number one, for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty, and I'm sure. pretty sure that probably had a larger print run than this. Oh, no, there's no doubt. I think it's the largest one ever, right? Yeah. So you look at 8 million. Um, will this achieve that classic, iconic status, though? Um, I don't know. I'll go out on a limb and say, even though this book probably does 150,000, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I don't think that that cover A will surpass, say, cover A of that 1991 X-Men. And here's the thing also it, is, let it run for a while. Right. I don't want to see a 2022 reboot. <laughs> right. That would be – that's the key is let Hickman take this. Um, let this thing get to issue 50. Yeah. And then if we get there, right, if we're sitting in issue 50 and issue one is no longer on shelves anywhere um, and people are really digging the series and collectors are going back and grabbing back issues, then the book has a chance. Yeah. And I guess that's – I think that's where, Brian, if you if we're being honest, maybe that's where our pessimism comes in is we just – it's not so much that, hey, this is the millionth X-Men number one. No, it's not even that because, again, I don't – that's not something I buy into. It's the fact that will there be another one after this in a short yeah. period of time, which then negates this one. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of like when I was heavy into collecting cards and when I got out of collecting cards back in the 90s is keep it – x-men titles keep them small because when you start losing well when i start losing interest is when you have 16 different x-men books now and it's like wait a minute i you know i it's kind of like like when i related to cards is like you had tops donruss flare upper deck and then you had six different top sets six different donruss sets six different fleer sets and it just like got too crazy too expensive and you just kind of lost attention because you didn't know where to follow i i wasn't an x-men fan before i've been reading x-men I enjoy it. I'm anxious to read this book. Um, and that's my only fear is I don't want to branch out into having to read a bunch of different X-Men titles. Yep. X-Men Red, Gold, Rainbow, <laughs> Blue Green. <laughs> but anyway, moving right along, the next one on the reader buzz was actually Absolute Carnage tie-ins. So I was Grabbed a bunch of art from a bunch of different tie-ins that were out this week. Uh, this isn't all the covers for the tie-ins because there was a lot of them. Yeah, it just gives you a good idea of what we're talking about. You, you know, you've got the Scream issue, I think, three. Yeah. You've got the Deadpool issue, two or three. Uh, Avengers issue one. And then the Symbiote of Vengeance number one, right? Right. The key to it is um, people are reading these tie-ins for the first time. You know, we talked about this before, so we won't go into it at length, but the last big story was Warner Realms. And you could basically ignore the tie-ins. Most of us did. Um, that is not the case with this. Now, while the tie-ins maybe aren't, say, t to adding a whole lot to the story, they are still being read by readers as, like, mandatory reading for Absolute Carnage. I think it's a testament to how good Absolute Carnage is that people kind of can't get enough. I think a lot of these will be overlooked because it, this week, they're coming out the same week Absolute Carnage comes out, and there's several of them. Um, I think people will look to put together master sets more than just Absolute Carnage 1 through 5. I think they will look for these tie-ins. I think long-term, any of these Absolute Carnage books will have a chance, I'll say a chance, at rising in value depending on what the print run is. Yeah. Um, I know. One thing I, I would do is a lot of these had incentive variants, and I would kind of hopefully watch it, watch and see if they go down below ratio, and then if it's at a good buy-in, pick up some of those incentives, especially if you like the cover. We always say, buy what you like, right? But they're... If it does have that chance of picking up, and if you get some of those incentives under ratio, it might be a good buy-in if these books ever do gain heat. But yeah, and my thought is, you know, you know, you and I are heading to a convention this weekend. We'll be on the convention floor, digging through boxes. Um, 
it's going to be too early this weekend. But like a year from now, a year from now, Baltimore Comic Con time, as long as Absolute Carnage ends properly, I will probably be pulling any of these Absolute Carnage tie-ins I can out of dollar boxes. If if dealers are going to get rid of them, um, I'll grab them for a dollar and hope that like Absolute Carnage 2 gets announced or, um, you know, Venom number four, Absolute Carnage, the movie comes out. Um, I, and I did that last ride that wave last year at Baltimore Sunday when people are kind of trying to get rid of stuff because they don't want to take it home. Some people weren't because last year Baltimore was the week before New York, so they were just keeping it, taking it to New York. But there was one dealer there that had variants and center variants mm. and was selling for a dollar. And I was picking up a bunch of there's like some Terry Dots and Avengers, some Terry Dots or X Men, um, a bunch of those incentives that were cheap, and I just grabbed them up because. One, the cover art was fantastic, and I mean for a buck, so the deals are there. Yep, and it's and it's also one of those things where, um, oh, the, with the nature of incentives, that's why I brought up cover A's. Um, people order more cover A's these days to be able to afford the incentives, to be able to get them, uh, to be you know reach those incentive goals. So I'll be happy to grab those dollar cover A's down the road. Um, I, I think back to Maximum Carnage. Um, there was a time when you could pick up all of those Maximum Carnage books for a dollar, and now you look at what that set sells for, um, with the average book selling for, say, 6 to $8, and, and maybe not individually, but lotted together. And you could sneeze on that, but that's a huge return on your investment. So um, I'll be looking to see a duplication in that this time around. Then the last book on the Reader Buzz section this week was Nightwing number 65. This is a book that for the last few issues, people have been bringing up why isn't it on the Bolo list, which is why it's here, because people have been talking about it finally. Um, again, if you're not happy that something's not on the Bolo list, then you have to do your part to spread that good word about that book, to have people talking about it and posting it. This Nightwing story um, is getting very dark. We're seeing some changes with Dick Grayson, some revelations about his history, um, about who he is and where he comes from. We're seeing Talon, a very popular character from the New 52 run, kind of come back into focus. Um, and, and the relationship between Talon and Dick Grayson being center stage. Um, Dick is going through some changes, as you can kind of see with his look on the cover. Like puberty? <laughs> see, yeah, now this is a whole new Dick Grayson now. This is him, Dick Grayson the man figuring out <laughs> what's up? who he really what's up, is. guys? Um, and his, you know... He kind of had this ideal for himself, right, as like the the Batman of Bloodhaven, essentially, right? right? The big the big hero, and now he's finding out he's maybe less of a hero than he thought. Um, he has a more nefarious history, and uh, this has been a good read, and it's it's also one that I'm like maybe more interested in reading going forward. Um, I've always kind of been in and out of this Nightwing series. I've liked it, but I haven't say stayed true to it. But it's it's got me back hooked into it again. Yeah, I, I've done that. It's funny you mention that because I did that as well where I come coming in and out of arcs. Um, I haven't re been reading it for a while, but now that you mention it and the way you talk about it on the show, definitely look forward to picking this up. Um, I'm not a fan of the cover B, though, because it looks like you got the Hamburglar on there crashing through a fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, like cover, I definitely like cover A with the ominous, like, Court of Owls masks and Talon, which is what this story is all about. That's, that's wholeheartedly where, where the hook on this story is. And that's going to wrap up the Reader Buzz section. Again, people that are watching this during the premiere that are in the live chat right now, thank you so much for joining us in the chat. And if you're watching on the replay, make sure, as we said, comment, let us know what books you guys enjoyed this week. What was your favorite read? What do you think is your best hot flip if you're in a speculation? Those are the comments we like to hear and we respond to. And then we're just going to go right into the Variant Buzz section. Then the first book on the variant buzz this week is Crazy Number One. This is a one shot, right? Right. This one kind of um, kind of caught me off guard. This was one I, I almost I don't know if I overlooked it in the solicits, but this one is driven by kind of the awesome cover art of their two variants that they have, um, the one in twenty five and the um, cover B, you know, regular priced variant. Yeah, which Both I like the cover B the best out of all of them. Me too. And, and both have sold out at most retailers. Um, both are doing well in the secondary market. 
and I also think have some good long-term potential. Just off the fact that this is a very low printed book when you consider that it comes out the week of X-Men 1 and Absolute Carnage 4 and some big some big time releases. Even that Batman uh, Nightfall book was a book that people were all over. Um, I think that this one has maybe some long term legs just on the variant perspective. But uh, great cover art, like as you know, as we talked about, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's one now I'm curious to read. But uh, anything that kind of gets Deadpool involved is always going to have a little bit of buzz. But um, but yeah, this one's a, it, it, this one kind of is out of left field. It's a little you know a little on the nose, but it's a little crazy. So we'll see what uh, we'll see what this one does long term. Right, I think the one twenty five keeps you know keep, keeps it more relevant. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm still stuck on that cover B. I mean, Wolverine's claw coming through the door, all that. If it was just the cover B and the cover A without the incentive, I would be more skeptical, especially if you're looking at, you know, picking it up for, say, speculation or whatever. Because right. it would have that same – what was that one that had the while back with the the secret variant? What was it? The, the, the Shit's Creek? Yes. Yes, the uh, Ziggy Pig. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Silly, silly seals, Z- Ziggy Pig, or something like yeah. that. But I, I think having that one in twenty, I can see that one in twenty-five, kind of having that um, underground kind of popularity with the, the characters in the cover, especially collectors of Deadpool and Wolverine, and then just this book, maybe not being too many copies of it. Right. But, right. I, I kind of agree with your assessment right there. Uh, I think there won't be many copies of. One, the one in 25, so that has a shot, but I like cover B better, yeah. and I think a lot of people will think that way. Exactly. Let's just agree to agree. Yeah, right? <laughs> Moving on, next one in the variant list was Marvel Tales Ghost Rider number one. This is the one in 100 in Hyak Lee variant. Right, so now we've seen this kind of play out with the Jen Bartel stuff. And then that kind of died out. Um, again, there's nothing to of note really in the guts of these Marvel tales. They are reprints, but they've been traditionally some of like I can't say the lesser important issues being reprinted. They're saving um, those for the facsimile. <laughs> yeah, your facsimile true firsts. Um, having said that, the obviously the the cover art of this one in one hundred is gorgeous. Um, we've seen sales anywhere from, say, 80 to 100, um, which is kind of at ratio, I guess. Nothing, uh, nothing I would say with this one of huge note, um, but it was heavily talked about as I think people were kind of back intrigued about the possibility of this being a spec play. But it's one to keep an eye out to see if it goes somewhere. Right. I mean, it is gorgeous cover art. I mean, I know Lee is one of those artists right now, but it was to me, even at the regular buy-in, it didn't gain my interest enough to, to want to spend that amount of money on it, put it that way. Right. Yeah, me either. So I started, personally, I mean, again, buy what you like, but personally, I wouldn't... Um, this wasn't one that I would run out and spend the hundred dollars on. I think there's better places to put your money um, this week, even. So then the next one on the list is Venom number eighteen. This is the second print, but the one in twenty five incentive, correct? Yeah, and this looks great. I think this is an excellent cover art, but I gotta say, you know, buy what you like, guys. But we got as an industry, we gotta say no to these. I just that's just my feeling. Um, to to me, it looks like something that. You would get in an email saying, "Hey, print this out so your kids can color some venom." <laughs> That's true, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think it, it's a cool process shot of these immortal variants, which I think, when done right, are incredible. Um, but it, it's a cash grab on a second print. Again, as cool as this is, right? It's no, it's no wonder that like Midtown was charging thirty four dollars for this. They've got to. They've got to charge $34 for this because they're not going to sell the regular second print because issue 18 was a, just a, 
ordinary issue, right, in the run. It wasn't it wasn't what people hoped for. Now it looks like 19. Obviously, everybody was going for that Dylan spec. It didn't work out. But this is a cash grab. This this entire second print was created to sell this 125 variant. Um, so we see this stores go and they um, you know they buy this book. They pay two dollars a book. They're paying fifty dollars to acquire this book. That causes them to sell this book anywhere from thirty five to fifty just to recoup their money. Um, and then they're you know they maybe sell some of those second prints on the shelf to make a little bit of profit. Then they're getting stuck with like ten to fifteen of those. And it's why like the Immortal Hulk sixteen second print just doesn't go for much. Um, or they and could I just think, not order them, and then maybe Marvel would get that say, "Oh, these aren't working anymore." And not which, which is what, which was my original point. As an industry, I, I don't want to tell anybody what to buy. Right? We say that we're not your comic broker, um, and I'm not your like moral comic police. Right? We're not ten dollar comic cops. Um, I'm never gonna be that guy. We all know those guys, right, Brian? Like those guys who feel the need to. Well, I have to tell you what to do for the betterment of the hobby. Um, that, I'm not that guy. Okay, you buy what you like. If you if you had to have this, I get it. Um, there's a lot of you Venom completionists who aren't going to let something like this go, and I understand that. Um, but that's why you buy what you like. If you like it, buy it. Right, but I just think I, I'd be remiss to say that those of us who are frustrated with this kind of continuous move by Marvel, buying it is what is helping continue this happening and then we see when these things get real popular if like tons of people were buying it then you start to see things like stores do second print store variants which is another thing i'm not a huge fan of um and then when they do the second print store variant they're doing it just to get hunt you know dozens of copies of these um i just think at some point we have to kind of come together as best we can as a community which if you know anything about the current comic book, say, collecting and speculation community is difficult for us to do. There's just so many polarizing, different opinions, a lot of toxicity in there as well. Um, it becomes difficult for us to come together. But this is one thing that I think most of us just don't like. There's very few of us who sit there and go, you know, I, oh, I like these. You know, In general, I think this is good for the hobby. Most of us say we don't like them. I think FOMO gets the best of people. And, um, but again, I mean, it's not my job to tell you what to buy and what not to buy. If you don't like it, I'm not your comic broker. Um, but I will give you my opinion and how I feel about these. While I think this is a great cover, gorgeous. Um, it doesn't need to exist. I don't get frustrated with it. I think it's an ugly ass cover for one, but I don't ever get frustrated with it because I'm not spending my money on it. If other people want to spend their money on it, have at it. It's not on my radar. But see, you're a tough guy because you're less value driven with your collecting, right? right. Yeah, I I'm just more purely what I like. I mean, it, it, hills and valleys are sometimes where I'm like more into collecting to invest, and then I just purely buy what I want to read. Um, it's just, I just wonder, like your beloved Thor God of Thunder run, if they were doing this in that run, right? Would you feel differently? You know, that's a that's a run you love. You love I can reading. see where people get upset if, say, you spent a, spent a, you invested an amount of money into something, and then they turn around and kind of now they did something that kind of lowered the value of that. I can see where mm -hmm. people get frustrated with it. Right. But I also see they lowered the value of that one. There's something else down the road that you're gonna end up probably picking up that you're gonna make it. Up, you'll make it up. Next one we're gonna talk about is Batman eighty one. This is the Matina cover b variant cardstock variant right this storyline has been awesome in my opinion this tom king story i think that they interrupted it and i think that that hurt it the magnum pi <laughs> yeah. yeah um this cover is amazing it kind of homages that original nightfall uh, yeah and i think it's timely coming out the week of the dark universe nightfall at the same point i think it's overlooked because of the dark universe book um i think less people are paying attention to this but I want to say that I believe in this book long term because I think that the the story's been great and the cover art, this Matina cover art is amazing. But man, at some point, Brian, got to stop uh, putting my faith in these cover bees. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I pick them up just for the collection because, yeah, they're gorgeous. Um, 
might purge when I run into storage issues, but for the now, for the time being, I keep picking them up. Uh, could could be worse. It could be an Amanda Connor cover, but ain't that the truth, right? <laughs> ain't that the truth? I, I tell you what, if you're gonna buy something that doesn't take off, having great cover art. It's never, never a bad thing. Um, having, you know, and I've also brought it up before. There's a good ROI on these cover Bs as gold SS 9.8s. Um, a lot of people go to like key issues, but, you know, you take a gold SS 9.8, you know, you have a book like this that you paid like $3 for, $4 if you bought it off the rack, and you pay another, say, 20 to get it signed. Um, and, you know, you can easily double your money or more on books like this versus getting those keys signed that you're not really actually adding any value by getting Matina to sign a key. So that's something to think about. Especially with Matina. Um, he's a little bit more available now than he was, but he's still like exclusive to certain people, right? Certain. Right. Um, so getting Matina. Yeah, he, he, he was exclusive to one place. They dropped him when the whole gotcha. art suit came out. Um, he's now, there's like two or three, um, people who tend to bring him to conventions but he, he's a little more available now i think he, he's got to try to recoup some of that income he lost yeah so then the last book on the variant buzz is from vault it's that homage for that whole cult classic creature feature number one which homages that awesome frank avia archie afterlife i mean to me, if you were to look at the cover, you'd almost think that's Archie Afterlife. Today, like, oh, hold up, no, that's Creature Feature. I mean, right? I, I gotta give it a vault. Um, these vault vintages were dead for a while, right? Starting to die out. Um, and they're making a rebound. I think the now part of this, the popularity of this, I think, is like what you said. The the cover, of this is fabulous. But they've had fabulous covers not do well. You've brought this up before, how speculators tend to kind of follow a trend. So this worked last week, so it'll, yeah. I assume it'll work again. I told Ben C., you know, we obviously, we have the heist coming from, um, from Vault. We have an Eternals variant that we're very excited about. But we didn't sell last two Vault variants very well. So there's also some apprehension, full disclosure. Um, we love working with Vault, so we want to continue to do that. But we just... With the initial release of the book, we weren't sure, like, what what's the reception going to per se be on this? Um, and I think that, you know, this was a conversation we had where we said, hopefully we can kind of draft off that plot heat. And I think that's partially what this is. This is coming off of the plot um, and the fact that the plots um, – I, I keep saying the plot. It's, it's plot. I'm aware of that. Um, there's no the in there. But uh, plots uh, – um, kind of a cover B vault vintage variant that went up to like 15 bucks right off the bat. So I think some of this could be that, um, that, that kind of anticipation of what will this be? Will this be one of those? Um, but I also think great cover art. We'll have to see if this is a trend that continues. We'll have to see what this one ends up selling for. I'll also say, I think this is a lesser ordered vault book than others. It was more under the radar than some of their other releases. I think Money Shot's got a lot of attention on it, um, and this was kind of like in a solicit with Money Shot kind of back-to-back, -back, and I think more people kind of gravitated in the Money Shot direction. Right, and I, for one, I'm a fan of them. I hope Vault continues to do these homage variants. Um, oh, don't ever stop, please. It's, they're amazing. Um, they're great to collect. Forget the speculation. This is a fun collection to put together. So... Yeah, and usually, um, I know Nathan Gooden and Tim Daniels usually do a lot of these vintage variants, but uh, I enjoy them. I usually pick up, a lot of times it usually causes me to pick up cover A and B just because I kind of want both covers, but. Now, Brian, you, you collect these like I do. You know, have you noticed that like we're getting to like half a short box on these now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're yep. so, pretty soon I'm going to have a vault vintage short box put together, uh. It's kind of cool. Kind of cool getting down the road. I'm waiting for... You know what we haven't even hit with Vault yet, though? Optioning. Yeah. Like, we haven't even hit the point where these things really, really pop off in the secondary market. So, I'm waiting on that. Yeah. So, that's going to bring us to close on the Variant Buzz section. We're going to go now into Jack's Long-Term Plan. 
And for the long-term play this week, we have Captain Marvel number 11. This is a... I'm still not on the Captain Marvel train. I understand I went talking about Star. And this is something that... Actually, my wife is interested in kind of starting to read. So I'll let her read it. But long-term play away, Jack. Yeah, so now we talked about this one on the last call show. This is kind of a pro move where we said to, to people, we said... Issue 12 is highly soliciting dark Captain Marvel. It was a just a speculator veteran opinion that we'll see her at 11. Did we see her? I think so. Um, but this is why I want to unpack this. Um, people said to me, well, why isn't this a first appearance of Dark Star? Well, it's hard to call this Dark Star because she doesn't have the costume. Here's the other thing. I keep seeing these these characters talked about like they're separate. Dark Star and Dark Captain Marvel. I think Star is Dark Captain Marvel. I think that that that's what I think that character's in reference to. And if even if you look at the Dark Captain Marvel, she has a star on her. So I think that Star, when she goes dark, becomes Dark Captain Marvel, right? And even the Star solo series coming out, the solicit talks about her new powers. I think those are the powers she picked up in the end of this book. Um, new power issues have never carried weight in the secondary market long term. So I, I don't know about that. The reason this is the long term play is first off, this I think that this this run is becoming iconic. Um, it's going to be maybe the most important Captain Marvel run of all time. I, I, I don't say maybe. I can't think of another series of books that have ever been released. Captain Marvel is one of those series that have been rebooted like X-Men a million times. Other than number ones, there really haven't been anything that's ever picked up, any sort of steam. Um, it's also important to note there was a issue number 10, second print, a star design variant that released today that I think is a good one to grab long term. It's going to have a good low printing, kind of under the radar. Um, but why I didn't put this as a first appearance is the market's going to decide if it's a first appearance. If I go and I call it a first appearance, I'm actually going to influence the market because 10,000 people read the Bolo list just on Instagram. Um, another like 2,000 on comicbookinvest.com, um, upwards of 8,000 on Facebook, um, the 2,000 people that will watch this show. You start adding that up, I don't want to – be the authority saying this is a first appearance. That, that's not my role. That's not, again, we've tried to tell you guys, and we're, Brian and I are as genuine as it is when we tell you guys, like, wow, this is not like a list we're trying to create. I'm not trying to make this. I'm not the authority on this. The market decides that. So when we put something as a confirmed first appearance, we, we take that very, very seriously. So I would rather have three or four people in a comment section talking shit because they think that I missed something rather than to put something in there that steers you in the wrong direction. So would I call this the first appearance of, of dark star probably, but she doesn't wear the costume. And I think the costume is a big part of it. Um, either way, I think it's an extremely important issue. I think 12 will be very, very important, but this issue will have a much lower print run than issue 12 which when you start to look at this run and you say eight was very important right 10 was very important nine had a smaller print run i think the same thing is happening here with 11 either way i think eight through 12 is becoming key um when you look at the fact they already announced a star solo series we talked about when star got created her opportunity for long-term success is the fact that Captain Marvel doesn't have a nemesis, and I think we may have found that nemesis just based on the popularity of this character. I also heard there was some cosplay out there for Star at, at NYCC, which Brian and I have talked about on the channel. Cosplay is big. That's yeah, a good barometer um, of how popular absolutely, the character is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and again, especially with women. You brought your wife up reading this book, right? Um a lot of these series, is, that's where they find their success. Um, everyone knows on the channel I'm a big Spider-Gwen guy, um, but that's definitely a series that is really championed by women. A lot of women read that series and connected with that character. 
Um, you know, I immediately think of uh, women that I have known who maybe don't like the bubbly superhero and connect more with the dark kind of woman with demons. And um, I think that's where Star will be kind of successful. Um, so I th- this is my long-term play. I, like I said, I could have picked, picked Marked and I could have picked Batman Nightfall. This is my long-term play just because I think this story as a whole, which is funny. At some point, we need to master cut, Brian. Go back and cut each – talking about each of these issues because I think you're going to see a progression in positivity, at least for my part. Because when issue eight came out, I was like, don't waste $25 on a book. We have no idea what this character is going to be. But I admit I wasn't reading that series as most of you weren't. Um, and now I am. Still not. See, I am because, you know, I'm a market guy. Yeah. So if it's moving on the market, I got to pay attention. But I tell you, Brian, if you were reading it, I think you'd be enjoying it. Um, it's it's really, really well done. Well written. Those Mark Brooks covers are gorgeous. And there's enough people like you not reading it that the print runs pale in comparison to some of the other Marvel releases. Like, notice how you don't see, um, you know, eight covers for this book. To me, you may get mad. You may shoot me. This series right now is in line with Immortal Hulk and Venom as like leaders for Marvel as far as importance and quality um, and long-term viability. I think if you're a speculator and you're in this purely for the money, you should be looking at 8, 9, 10, 11 right now. You should be grabbing those issues when you see them for cover price. And I include the late printings. Those design variant late printings I think are going to be a set people are going to want. Um, between Captain Marvel, Minerva, uh, Star. Um, and I think the Star Solo series, we're going to see 9 million store variants for, but I think will be very popular. Um, and store variant is another thing to talk about. So there is a, a, a store out there who I'm not going to mention, who is notorious for doing this, who's done this before, Brian. If you think about, uh, old red go- goblin when there's a store that made a store variant for this issue and put um dark captain marvel on the cover i kind of hate that because she does not appear in costume in this book and they're trying to like almost circumvent the first appearance i don't understand why marvel approves that um but they did and um there will be some debate once issue 12 drops is that store variant the book to get? I'll, I'll, and if for you new in the hobby, guys, there may be a short window where that book will get hot, right? And we saw that with the ASM 797 Red Goblin cover. There was a window where that book, which was a 10 to $15 buy-in, was like a 40 to $60 book, no doubt. But it crashed and burned and actually created customer resentment over time. Um, and the market will never deem those – Variant covers as first appearances. They'll certainly never deem a store exclusive long term as a first appearance. So be if you're doing that burn and turn, but stay. I'd say again, it's one of those things. Kind of like vote with your money and say no. I can't totally fault the store because I mean we make variants. That's an easy cash grab, but I don't love it. Um, and then for you true firsters out there, right? For you Topher S fans, Mass Speculate fans, Formal the Puppet fans, at the end of this book, there is imaging of Dark Captain Marvel and what's coming in like the letters section that who knows down the road could be pointed to as something of note. Um, but that doesn't always guarantee to take off because in Edge of the Spider-Verse number one, they actually have imaging of Spider-Gwen at the end of that and no one even mentions that so that doesn't always become popular but it's just worth a note and it maybe adds a little bit of something to this but either way i like this book long term i think that um i like this this run of books long term and i think that 
you're you're kind of safe putting your money into these books because I just don't think they're printed in mass like some of the other popular Marvel books that I brought up as kind of comparison factors, um, Immortal Hulk, Venom, things like that nature. So there it is. That's Jack's long-term play this week, and that's also going to wrap up the Bolo list for this week. Real quick, also remember, Jack and I will be at Baltimore Comic Con this weekend, so we will be getting content from there. We will be also make sure you follow us on Simple Man's Comics on Instagram and AKA Mr. Bolo on Instagram. We'll be putting content up there as well. Who knows? We might have some giveaways going on, so make sure you follow us and make sure you click that thumbs up button for us. And if you're new, please consider subscribing tomorrow night. We might be in Baltimore, but we will have a new episode of The Last Call, which is our pre-FOC show. Right, Jack? Absolutely. We're double dipping tonight to get that to you guys out there in the comic family, uh, Simpleman's Comics family, Bolo Nation. We will not miss that. Again, that's The Last Call show, the pre-FOC show, where we highlight books on the FOC list coming up to final order cutoff on Monday, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um it's your last opportunity to lock in those guaranteed orders with your LCS, lock in those guaranteed orders with your online retailer, get the biggest possible discount you can. Um, and again, nothing nefarious with that show. We are just literally trying to give the knowledge that we have acquired over the years to you, our beloved Simpleman's Comics family, and something we take very serious, and um, share a little knowledge, talk a little comics. And have a little bit of adult Kool-Aids with you, the community. I love seeing you guys in the chat saying you're having Kool-Aids with us. We, I think that's the coolest. Yes. And also, next week, the Hot and Cold Show will return at its original scheduled time. But we're going to have some announcement to make about that show when it airs. No, yeah, we've got, got, we've got something uh, to talk about. Um, we're going to discuss next week and we'll leave we'll leave that as a cliffhanger but we've definitely got some programming changes coming down the 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 pike that we think you guys are going to be excited for that's going to give you guys more um and we're always trying to find those tweaks in the channel and the programming where we can to try to listen this is the biggest thing is listen to what you guys are telling us in the comments section so you guys have been asking for some things and we want to give them to you yes And with that being said, we wish you good night.